Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, the um, panel uh, called Podcasts and Other Media. Uh, and in, in addition to this being uh, basically an opportunity for me to gather all my cool friends together and have a chat, <laughs> um, we're also specifically going to talk about <clears throat> how the medium of podcasting um, kind of interfaces with um, people who deal with, you know, topics that are in various different arts and how, you know, when, you know, when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, a particular art form or whatever, um, but you're talking about it on a, in a podcast, which is an audio only medium. Uh, it's a, a medium that um, uh, kind of favors the spoken word. And so how do you get across, how do you deal with your, your topic matter? Um, you know, in that kind of a format. So I'm going to ask everyone to kind of introduce themselves and their podcasts. I guess I'll start first. Uh, so uh, I'm Mark, um, and I am uh, one half of the Endless Knot podcast, a podcast which talks about language and literature and all kinds of uh, different um, things. It's a very interdisciplinary podcast. So, you know, I'm quite interested in different disciplines and how they you know, how they work. I will pass this on. Say, Betty, you can go next oh, because sure. yeah, Betty's, okay. podcast, Bet Betty's podcast is actually in a lot of ways the, the primary um, inspiration for this topic. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh well thank you um yeah uh, i have a lot to say on this topic so we'll get to it um but hi everyone i'm betty um i i know some of you but for those of you who don't know me um i co-host a podcast called um pictorial um it's a, a podcast mostly about um like the fine arts like visual arts so um you know paintings sculptures multimedia art um we have you know uh, we do have we do have a variety of topics and we have we talk more about even like installations and more contemporary things um but yeah most most of our topics are, are quite visual uh, my co-host quinn actually did want to join but she is actually at work so <laughs> she cannot um but uh yeah so we've um been doing the podcast for about uh we're actually coming up to our third anniversary soon in december um it comes out every other week usually um and uh, we do actually have a youtube channel as well um but that actually uh, is only like a part of how we try to get our visualness across but i'll talk more about that later and corey uh, sure. Yeah. So my name's Corey. I am half of the podcast Ghost Notes, where me and my friend Noah argue about the philosophy of music, basically. Uh, we've been doing it for a little over two years now. Uh, we're both like music YouTubers for our day jobs. Like that's that's the main thing we do. But like Ghost Notes is just a way to have like less structured and more exploratory conversations about music that we don't really get a chance to get into in like the, the stuff that we're putting on YouTube. But yeah, that's me. And Julia. Yes, uh, I am Julia. Um, I am one half of Classically Trained. Uh, my partner, Allison, unfortunately, uh, also couldn't join us. She's not at work, but she works two weeks on one week off and takes her weekends when she gets them. Um, <laughs> we uh, we are a essentially like a kind of a media review podcast we talk about classical reception so the um uh, media modern media of all kinds that deals with ancient greek and roman um primarily material uh, we did do an episode of on the mummy so we branch out <laughs> a bit uh and but we so we have talked about television and film we've talked about music uh we have talked about books we uh, would like eventually to branch out to talk about games like video games um, and also tabletop. Um, I have I have grand aspirations about that. Uh, but yeah, so we actually have done all kinds of different non non podcast media um, on our podcast. So yeah, we've had to get a little creative. So yeah, as I as I sort of alluded to before, you know, Betty's channel was uh, kind of an inspiration for this because it's kind of, I guess, a bit of a running joke that um, you know you say 
you know, you're talking about visual arts on this great platform for visual arts and audio only, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, production. Um, so, I mean, in, in, in what ways does uh, the audio only format um, uh, of a podcast present challenges in dis discussing your, your topic matter? Um, yeah, so uh, I'll start <laughs> with that. So we, uh, yeah, we we kind of, uh, we kind of always talk about how when we first proposed the pictorial as a, as a topic um, to our uh, podcast network, um, Relay FM, uh, which actually is usually has like tech related podcasts, although they have branched out to like other topics, including ours in recent years. And um, the um, one of the network owners, Mike, he said, I love this idea. It's a podcast that shouldn't be a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so and we so um, I think initially so be, because I also have a YouTube channel, um, which is called Articulations, where I am able to show things visually. Um, we decided from the beginning to have a YouTube version for our podcast where you can actually see the art that goes by on the screen when you're watching it. Um, although we, we did through analytics, actually, most people listen to our podcast, like not on YouTube, but actually with, you know, Overcast or iTunes or Spotify. Uh, so they, um, most people aren't actually not able to, to see the, the artworks. So we do make an effort that every time we talk about something, one of us describes it, like what we're actually looking at, like, you know, with words. Um, but one thing that actually Quinn started doing randomly was um, she realized the chapter artworks um, is a thing, uh, which I actually didn't even know. Uh, so you can what you can change the artwork of your podcast that's displayed on the podcast player for different chapters. Um, and so she started using that in, as a way to put the an image of the artwork that we talk about on there. So I don't know if it works in every single podcast app, but it it at least works on um, Apple Podcasts. So we actually, uh, not to brag or anything, <laughs> drop a link, uh, the Apple Podcasts actually use the featured pictorial as an example of how to creatively use chapter artworks. Um, and so, but yeah, this is totally like Quinn came up with this. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, but I still like to brag about it. Yeah, well, and I remember, you know, what I often did when listening to your podcast was just, you know, pull out Wikipedia and search mm -hmm. the thing that you were, um, that you were talking about if I, you know, wanted to get, you know, get, get it into my head. But you, you did an episode a while back where, uh, in which you, you talked about, okay, here's what you do if you're going to, if you're approaching a painting for the first time and here, and you laid it out on all these steps. And one of them was just describe what you see which works really well for, um, you know, in a podcast medium is kind of trying to describe that, you know, that visual experience. Um, it's, it's kind of, in a sense, it turns a weakness into a strength because it makes you do that. Yeah, exactly. That's like a thing we've noticed, like even before I started doing podcasting when I was at the art gallery is like the act of describing what you're seeing, you're inevitably analyzing it or, or you're, you know, putting your own thoughts or your interpretations into your description, like even if you're just trying to objectively describe what you see, um, and you start to think about, you know, what you see, and it, you can use that to launch into like additional conversations. So yeah, so it's like the, the act of describing not only helps for someone who's maybe driving and can't pull over and open Wikipedia, <laughs> um, but also it helps us to like st actually start talking because while you're describing, mm -hmm. you're like, oh yeah, I actually noticed something in the painting I never noticed before because I wasn't trying to describe it. So I didn't pay as much attention. Cool. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? Um, um I'll, I'll, I'll just say briefly. I mean, so because we, um, because we review different. I mean, we review different kinds of media, both visual and non-visual. You know, we, we like books are easier in a lot of ways because you can read out little excerpts and stuff like that. Like, we don't do a ton of that. Uh, we're like both super paranoid about. Um, copyright and in particular like with 
um, the few episodes that we've done on music, we've just been like, it would be great if we could play a clip of this, but neither of us understands copyright law well enough to do it, particularly <laughs> now since like when we started, we were both in Canada and doing all of our production in Canada, but now she's in Canada and I'm in the US and like, we don't know how, <laughs> we just don't, we don't know yeah. and we don't want to cause problems for ourselves. So we don't, we don't play clips of anything that isn't in the public domain. Um, and so we do a lot of description like you were talking about, Betty, but also we, we have to, um, we give a synopsis of whatever we're talking about at the beginning of each episode. And then we kind of jump around describing individual scenes or whatever as necessary when, when we get into the nitty gritty. Um, which I'm sure provides kind of a disjointed experience for anybody who might be listening to an episode who hasn't consumed that particular piece of media. Um, I know for a fact that our episodes that are on more commonly known pieces of media get more downloads because more yeah. people, like they're just accessible to more people. We do our best. Um, and I know that like, my mother, for example, listens to my podcast and has not consumed much of the media that we discuss and has said that it's a fine experience to listen to regardless. But I'm sure that there are times when we simply can't describe something well enough or we just don't do a very good job. And that is something that I worry about constantly of like, are we being confusing in the way that we're talking about what was happening in this scene or whatever? Um, the episode that we recorded most recently, uh, which yesterday, was um, we 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 covered three episode three individual episodes of Doctor Who, which is for anybody who's ever watched an episode of Doctor Who will know um, they tend to be kind of convoluted. They're not easy to <laughs> like do a, a a brief summary of, and even then, like getting into individual scenes, it's like there's so much going on here that like well, we'll just do our best and hope that it's not, I, we had the same, I mean, television is actually very hard to do for that reason. Film is almost easier because things are a little more, they have more space to breathe narratively. So it tends not to be quite as dense and you, you can describe more. Whereas TV, because we've done, so we, we did, um, We've done three television episodes. We did, we just on Doctor Who, we did um, three episodes of Supernatural. And we also did, uh, we did a multi-parter on the Netflix series, Troy Fall of a City. Um, anybody who has ever met me knows that I hated that, but uh, <laughs> we did cover it extensively and we felt like we had to because of how dense it was. Um, there was really no way to, to do it in one episode because too much happens um so tv makes our lives really hard actually as far as describing stuff goes um other media has actually all been easier in my opinion than television i don't know why um i was just gonna say i i understand the sentiment about doctor who because we um we actually just we did recently an episode um unfortunately it's not available to everyone that was our membership special we talked about the doctor who episode where van gogh shows up um mm. and uh <laughs> by the way i had never seen a single episode of doctor who before i obviously have heard of it but i quinn's a big fan so then like we watched it and yeah we had to describe the episode um as well and and it was an it, it was different than you know normally we just describe like a still image this time we're describing yeah. a tv episode um yeah. i'm actually yeah i'm interested in Corey, like you know your your thoughts yeah. too on the uh the um especially the music copyright thing I've yeah heard. so yeah. uh i mean obviously being an audio only format isn't a huge barrier for us uh although like honestly we basically never use clips anyway not so much because of the copyright thing but just because it's the conversations are unscripted it's just like we talk for an hour and then edit that down and so like we often wind up going into directions we hadn't been planning we'll come up with examples and like we don't want to like grind the conversation to a halt where I, well I go look up a thing to go send Noah a link so he can listen to it so that, that he can know what to respond to so we don't tend to do a lot of that I mean coming from the YouTube side I think that you know, at least in the US, I can't really speak to anywhere else. So like, I would not 
take this on as advice for like Canadian copyright law or anything. But uh, I do tend to find having, especially from the YouTube side, that a lot of people are more cautious than they need to be about fair use. Because uh, often like if you're one of the main points of fair use in US copyright law is to allow room for commentary and critique. And so yeah. if you're doing an entire podcast episode where you are explicitly discussing for like an hour the historical context of this song, you're almost certainly in the clear to play basically as much as not in, I wouldn't play the entire song start to finish, but like, you know, if you pull clips to make points that you need to make, like, I, I don't think you would run into problems with that. Uh, I will add the caveat that I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I am someone who works in this space a lot and has had to figure out a lot about fair use in order to do the work that I do. So I, yeah. yeah. But we we had that conversation. We had that conversation before we did our I think yeah. I think our first music episode was on the mountain goats. And we thought about playing clips because it is hard to describe the mountain yeah. goats. <laughs> um yep. but ultimately we just decided to put together a Spotify playlist of the songs that we were yeah. gonna talk about and link that in our show notes and yeah. I mean that's go on from there. In, in a lot of the stuff that we do, um, especially again because the examples are sort of coming up extemporaneously, like we're We'll we'll just describe stuff anyway. Like you guys were saying, I think the description can be more valuable than actually playing the thing if you're trying to make a very specific point about it. Like especially because because we're not usually we're not doing like reviews. We're not doing like we're not talking about oh how this song is good or anything or like a, a like a close reading of an individual work. And so it's often like I, I think more useful to hear the point we're trying to make about the song than to listen to the song. And so, and there have been like occasions where something comes up and just to quickly get a point across, one of us will just sing something uh, just mm. to really quickly establish that. And then, you know, the entire, uh, our entire audience can laugh at our singing voices. Cause I, I do have a degree in vocal performance, but I do not warm up before we record. So, uh, but like, but I think that's sort of the extent of what we do. Uh, and more often when we bring up things, we're bringing up ideas behind songs. And so like, if I'm talking about say, uh, Steve Reich, I'm try trying to remember whether it was Steve Reich or Philip Glass, but Steve Reich's Pendulum music. Uh, like that's uh, an example that's come up a couple of times in our things. That is a piece of music that's four microphones swinging uh, over speakers. Mm -hmm. And like, I can play you that but it's much more useful to know what it is, right? It's to talk about that as a construct and as an idea than to just hear the patterns of feedback that you get from that actual, which is, it's a really powerful and interesting piece. I highly recommend it, but like just playing that for the like 15 minute runtime that it takes for those them to wind down is not actually gonna help, you know? Mm. Complete side note, I'm impressed that you're able to talk for only an hour. And then we talked for like two and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're we, lucky if we get it down to an hour. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, we, we usually know what cuts us off after hours. Like, yeah, it's been a while. It's like, oh yeah, it has cool. But I have a tendency to go on for too long. What we keep it short mostly so that Quinn doesn't have to edit too much. <laughs> but yeah. uh, she has almost every time has to be like Betty we need to stop <laughs> so because if she didn't I would talk for three hours or more we we trade off editing so it's yeah. at least yeah. at least it's on both of us <laughs> yeah anyway I just don't I still she still does everything and I don't even know how it gets uploaded <laughs> so. yeah yeah I don't do the editing so I'm all, all, always the one in trouble so <laughs> Even's nodding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, the, when when we talk about literary works, um, we have the advantage of mostly talking about historical um, stuff that's not under copyright anymore. Yeah. Though I would imagine that, you know, a lot of, um, you know, contemporary authors are fine to have passages read from their books. In fact, we have, we interview a number of um, writers and, you know, they come on and they sometimes read bits from their, their work. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how much more leery I think both Allison and I felt about playing clips of a song versus mm. 
reading aloud yeah. from a book because maybe maybe something about like like transforming the format made it feel more more fair yeah. to use when versus like I think I would have felt nearly if not as weird about for example playing a clip of a professionally produced audiobook than I would have yeah. about playing a song right. like I don't know just feels different even though legally it's probably yeah. the same and it also like a reading out a passage or whatever doesn't interrupt the flow of conversation in the same way that like cutting to a clip does mm -hmm. and so similarly like like i said in ours sometimes one of us will sing and part of that is just because it's easier to get access to but also it just feels more like we're having a conversation than if we're talking and then suddenly i cut and you hear kurt cobain sing something and then we cut back to us talking yeah yeah that's that's a good point i so out of curiosity does anybody sitting here script or are all of us just conversational no. conversational yeah do as yeah, little no, prep work as i notes. can <laughs> <laughs> yeah i actually do know some uh or a podcaster who, who does like a three-hour podcast and he scripts everything and i'm not sure yeah. how he's able to do that <laughs> i i have done that so we released a special episode in february which was actually a class project that i completed um I chose to produce a podcast for uh, instead of writing an, an essay, which was a mistake, to be clear. It was as much work <laughs> as writing an essay would have been. Um, in fact, maybe more work because my professor had me hand in the script. So I, and then I also yeah. had to record it and produce <laughs> it. And it was like, ah, uh, this was a mistake. Um, however, uh, but I did write a script for that in part because it was just me. It wasn't something that I did with Allison. Um, and it was, on the one hand, I was able to be more deliberate about how I was using the material. Like I was able to take, you know, yeah, like be more deliberate about, it was a review of a book. I was more deliberate about describing the scenes, giving the synopsis, discussing themes. I could like cite pages and stuff like that in a way that we usually can't. Um, but it was also like, that deliberateness definitely came with a time and effort cost that ultimately yeah. is not why I produce classically trained like Allison and I I mean for myself at least I make this podcast because it's a fun thing that I do with my friend not because yeah. I want to put in many many hours like meticulously describing scenes in books so instead we will sloppily describe scenes in books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I you know I I know when um what it, it, it I, I kind of compare it to to you know my approach when teaching and again you know I, I so I produce notes a lot of notes um but I don't you know script per se and, and that's the same with my teaching as with you know my approach to podcasting um though I probably write more down than maybe I mean certainly more than I think my co-host does um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and, and and getting back to the issue of, um, you know, having the material in front of you, you know, I always demand my students bring their text to class, you can't discuss it if you don't have the words in front of you. And yet, obviously, that's not, that's not even possible, um, you yeah. know, with a podcast, right? People can't have, you know, even if it's something that is a doable thing, they're not going to have, you know, whatever text uh, in front of them. In fact, very often they're, you know, especially, um, you know, like, Julia, when you talk about um, author books, right, novels or whatever, um, you know, probably a lot of people are listening in to find out new things to read, right? So they won't they won't know the material. Um, mm. So when you know when you discuss something like the Mummy or uh, Disney's Hercules or whatever, right, those are pretty yeah. famous, so you can probably yeah. be sure that people will know it. And and I guess the same is true for for you, Corey. Um, you know, a lot of the songs you talk are pretty famous, yeah. so. Yeah, we, we tend to, like, when one, something comes up that is a little more obscure, uh, we will usually try and explain a little bit more. Uh, but, like, if I just if I just want to mention Stairway to Heaven, I can say Stairway to Heaven and assume that most people listening will be at least passingly familiar. Yeah. It's interesting. We, we've, had, we've had the kind of interesting thing where, at least for myself, a number of the things that are probably the most 
well known or broadly consumed classical receptions are things that either Allison and I or certainly myself have never seen or haven't seen or read in many many years like prior to the episode that we did on Troy 2004 which is the thing that everybody mm. cites when they're like oh yeah a movie about Greek and Roman stuff I had never seen it before we did that episode I've never seen 300 mm. Um, I had never seen Gladiator from beginning to end yeah. before we did our episode on that one. So actually, I am often coming to our more popular media for the first time. So mm -hmm. I think we do an okay job of being even handed about the amount of description that stuff gets, in part because yeah. often one or both of us is consuming that piece of media for the first time, even if it is popular. I don't know. I like I'll be interested to see if we are able to be that even when, for example, we get to something that is both popular and we're familiar with it. Um, we still have yet to do our episode on Madeline Miller's The Song of Achilles, but both Allison and I have read it and also a lot of other people have read it. So I, you know, we'll see if we manage to maintain that level of like not assuming that people know what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things um, Quinn and I started doing actually, I would say halfway or after about a year of podcasting, we started with we both research a topic and then we talk about it. But there were a few consecutive episodes where it was something like either Quinn is really knowledgeable about, for instance, musicals and Broadway. She's really into that. So we did a few episodes on that and I knew nothing. I'd never seen a Broadway show before um, myself. And then there were a few times where I came with a topic that I was familiar with, but like Quinn had no idea about because we had an episode about nfts before she even heard of it <laughs> so um but so then we realized um it was actually a really good format and really fun when one person absolutely has no clue so more recently or in most episodes we do now it's we trade off like one episode it's her topic one episode is mine and quite often we start, we hit record and the person who's, it's not their topic that day doesn't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. Like, like Quinn would just be like, so today I'm talking about this thing I saw on TikTok and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, so then, um, or, uh, and, and especially when it's something where the other person is not familiar, like the musicals, it actually is kind of good because Quinn then has to describe it in a way that I, someone who has absolutely no idea, under can understand it, which then, I, like I can be a test for a listener who's never heard of mm. it, whether they would be able to, because if I don't even know what she's talking yeah. about, <laughs> there's a good chance the audience doesn't either. Yeah, we do sort of a similar thing. Um, not, not super intentionally. We do, I mean, we do like pick a topic, but like part of the premise of the show is that Noah and I, we both like spend a lot of time thinking about music, but from very different backgrounds. It's mm. like, I'm primarily a music theorist, whereas he comes much more from, sort of the cultural and historical analysis perspective. And so we'll we'll often wind up doing episodes that are very much in one of those camps. And so like if we do, like we did an episode on chord loops and I was thinking a lot about chord loops because I'm a music theorist, that's what I do. Uh, but like um, I had to sort of break down a lot of these thoughts to someone who really knows that music very well, but hasn't thought about it in those sorts of structural ways. And, you know, he'll often, like, I'll, I'll mention something off the, like offhand and he'll be like, okay, well, here's like a 20 minute uh, explanation of the history and context of that. And it's great. I love it. But it's just like having those different perspectives, even sort of not even like at an overarching like episode level, but even like in individual points in the conversation where we get to a point, it's like, okay, well, now, now it's Noah's turn to know all about this stuff and explain this aspect of it to me and then I'll turn around and explain some aspect of it to him and we can go back and forth like that and play off of each other's experiences and knowledge of the subject matter but yeah we we also do something similar um or at least we try to um typically we trade off doing we we were more intentional about trading off whose job it was to do research when we started um in the last few months, I mean, among other things, both of us have become wildly busy. So the amount <laughs> of research that gets done at all has declined. Um, you will notice in recent episodes, there are points at which one or both of us is clearly looking something up as we talk, because we're <laughs> like, we know that we don't know about this and we don't want to just say stuff. Um, not that that stops us always, but you know, 
um we're like nominally scholarly so we try uh but we do um although we have pretty significant overlaps in terms of the content that we're familiar with um Allison is a late antique archaeologist like she does late Roman earthquakes and I do Homeric and classical Greek literature so we are very methodologically different and although we have a lot of the same basic training in terms of history and cultural studies and stuff for in antiquity um like I am a literary analyst and she is an archaeologist. Um, so she talks about material culture and she also has like a much keener kind of visual memory and perception. She notices visual details. Meanwhile, I'm like, did you catch the line where he said X? It was a reference <laughs> to what, you know, like, so we do pick up on different things. And I, I think that, so even though both of us have consumed the media in question, we notice very different things. Um, and we bring different specializations to the table. We're interested in different things. Um, and typically, yeah, usually if it's Greek, I do the research. If it's Roman, she does the research and we kind of do our best yeah. to make sure one one of us doesn't fully know what's going on. Um, again, I don't know how well we managed to balance that, but certainly we and and sometimes we just get to a point where we're both like i don't know <laughs> but this is the thing that we both noticed and we don't know enough about like neither of us are specialty specialists in this particular aspect of antiquity and the problem with classics as a field is that often you kind of need to be a specialist in that specific area to know anything about it because of how weird and picky some of this stuff is so yeah we had a, this this point brought to you by the whole conversation that we had in the episode we recorded yesterday about the Sybil. Neither of us knows anything yeah. about the Sybil because we don't know anything about, particularly in the Roman context, because we don't know much about, like I know about oracles in Greece, but I don't know about them in Rome. <laughs> and Allison right. also doesn't know about Roman religion. So we were like, it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Onward, I guess. Anyway, so yeah, I like suffice to say, we do our best to describe what and and to share what knowledge we have but also like yeah. we do a lot of going yeah we just can't really talk about this because neither of us knows <laughs> well i i think maybe we should um at this point open the discussion up to um anyone else who has questions or uh comments or wants to you know build off of anything that we've been discussing uh we're a small enough group now uh, here that I think uh, we can just leave that, uh, you know, just go ahead and unmute yourself and start talking. Yeah. I have a question for Mark, but potentially for the rest of the, um, the panelists too. You mentioned um, your students a bit, and I was just wondering, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of like conveying other mediums through podcasts or even the interplay between them with my students. And I was wondering how it had informs your teaching if you have students work with this if you have them create podcasts or if it just informs your teaching in other ways uh i think a, a little of each really um so i do use um both podcasts and um youtube videos as part of um you know the class either it's something that they will watch or listen to um as part of the readings or things that I will, uh, you know, kind of play in class and use that as um, sort of jumping off point for, for a discussion. So I'll prepare some questions, I'll show them a video or whatever, and then I'll prepare some questions based on that video uh, and then uh, get them kind of talking. Um, but I also um, very often will uh, have a final project kind of against, uh, you know, just doing more and more essays. So I'm trying to, you know, come come up with non-essay ideas for, for a cumulative final project. And so I what I have done is uh, have a sort of creative project at the end. And I give them the options of, you know, do a podcast, do a video, um, along with, you know, numerous other possible creative um, ways like create a board game or, uh, or whatever. 
So it, so it's, it's kind of on both sides, um, depending on the comfort level of the student. You know, if they want to do podcasting, that's great. I mean, I've, I haven't been teaching for very long, um, but the, the, what little, oh, sorry, Mona, please, please don't. The cat's got some problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I do like to have visuals, um, but I am actually not a super visual person. And so I often don't think about it until it's too late in my like preparation. And then I'm like, oh, darn, I should have like made some slides so that I can show you what this looks like. But instead, I just kind of end up describing things to students a lot because I truly just forget to find photos of things. Um, <laughs> my my co TA who's teaching the same course, he and I share an office, and he is an archaeologist and is eternally horrified by me. I think, um, but like, I do think that having done, having gotten the po the practice in podcasting, I, like I think I've gotten better at just being able to put things in terms. But the other thing is. I don't know, I find also probably my favorite thing about doing that in like a teaching environment is that then I can stop and be like, does that make sense? Which is not a thing you can do on a podcast. Like you can't get the listener to clarify yeah. whether it makes yeah. sense yeah. because they're, you know, far, they're far removed from you, but your students can tell you <laughs> if the description makes sense to them. And if it doesn't, you can describe it another way is mm -hmm. like, that's, that's just always what I fall back on. And uh, I, sh I should add, I, I do also, uh, you know, as I said, I do read things out in class, you know, and I have them, I tell them a passage, if I'm reading a bit of poetry, I do read it out um, so they can get the sound of it, especially when it's, you know, when I'm talking about medieval literature, um, I think it's important to hear the sound. Um, so I do, you know, to hear what the language was like. Um, mm -hmm. And in this sort of special uh, case of, uh, a, film course that I've taught, um, then yeah, I, I show a lot of clips um, in, in class, as well as assigning uh, viewings outside of, you know, classroom time. So. Yeah, the critical thinking you both, or you all really mentioned that goes into just describing things is really staying yeah. with me. And, and yeah, it seems like a really a, an interesting way into the classroom too. Yeah, thank you both. And when uh, just getting back to the film thing, I one of the things I do very early on in that class is I do a little a little mini session on um, a, you know a bit of film theory and and particularly terminology because mm -hmm. that's the other thing you, you've got to have the the terminology to describe you know what is depth of field uh, you know what is um, mise en scène what is um, uh, a montage or whatever um, so it, it it is you know learning to speak about a, uh, a particular, um, you know, uh, genre of art um, is, I think, part of the, the educational process there. I mean, they're, they're going to start noticing things um, without the terminology, but giving them the, the ability to express it. Uh, so it's not just me having terms that I can use to describe something to them, but giving them the terminology to describe what they're seeing to me, I think is an important part of the process. Yeah. Anyone else? Can I, can I bring up, there was like a discussion about this in the chat briefly, but I just wanted to bring up show notes and how people use show, show notes. notes. Um, yeah. I think Ian, you asked a question about this, um, that yeah, like very few listeners look at show notes, um, which can yeah. be problematic when yeah. it's one of the few ways that we can convey non-audio information. Um, and I mean, as a listener, I don't look at show notes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I do. I look at them briefly. Um, if, But yeah, like uh, speaking only for myself, and this is what I said in the chat, I only put stuff in the show notes. If I have specifically said in the episode, I will put in show notes a link to X because I know that otherwise people probably aren't going to look 
at them, but I'm yeah. I am curious if anybody else wants to speak to that. Um, a little yeah, more, I mean, I, I I raised the question and I've tracked links in show notes and I see next to nothing in terms of people actually referencing those links and actually um, going through them, despite yeah. saying like you, Julia, within the the podcast, you know, you can see this map, you can see this, you know, photos or videos or stuff like that, but people just don't do it. I think mainly yeah. because the attraction of podcasts is you can listen to it anywhere. And so you're out walking yeah. the dog, you ain't going to get your phone out to uh, look up some map or something. Yeah, we don't. We we mostly just like put like a couple sentence description of the episode and then like links to our social media and whatever. Like coming from YouTube, like it's just so well known in the YouTube space that no one reads descriptions. And so, you know, you can put all the sources you want in your descriptions. No one's clicking on them. So I've just just never seemed all that important to us to put that much effort into show notes when we moved into the space. Yeah, for us, show notes actually turned out to be kind of only internally useful for us working yeah. on the podcast because I now I, I eventually got too busy and hired someone to edit the YouTube versions of our our episodes and the show notes are primarily for the editors to know where <laughs> to find the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that the thing that's worth saying though is is that being said if you've got a separate website with the show notes in as well that's going to help you with SEO and discovery. Mm. So you know, there, there, there are some probably potential hidden benefits there. But then again, it's difficult gathering the evidence as to whether people are discovering that and then becoming a listener or, you know, really what's going on there. Yeah. So uh, someone had their hand raised. I don't. Yeah, Daniel had yeah, Dan. his hand up. Yeah. Daniel, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been on mute for so long. I totally forgot I was on mute. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do show notes for both my podcasts, like the academic one and the pop culture kind of more comedy podcast or whatever. And I guess it's only because like, I see podcasting not just even as like getting people in the present time to kind of go, that's what it is. But like, like years from now, this is all going to be there. And like, someone might not know who, especially on the academic podcast, like who some of these authors are, like, even though I might know who, you know, what someone is like, 20 years from now, if the podcast still exists on a space or whatever, someone can go, oh, I've never heard of this person. Boom. And they might click it. So I kind of see it more archival in ways mm -hmm. and not so much worrying too much about how many people click on it now. If a person's name is there and I can grab it, I'm going to put it in there. A book title, I'm going to put it in there. Um, I pull quotes, some, like uh, some quotes from the episode so people can tweet them, but also like kind of get a view. I'm also trying to work on the transcript part, Amelia, I promise. But like <laughs> I'm trying to do that, you know, but this is a solo project, like all that comes out of pocket. It's all me editing, recording, social media, both podcasts. So it's like, at least if I can get the notes and I don't have the transcript right now, at least there's a list of texts and a list of names and a list of places if I can, if it's important, especially when I do things about current events like we did episodes on during um after you know when george floyd was murdered i need to put his name in there i need people to understand the yeah. events i need to understand the videos and and so like it's important for me to put that there so again 15 years from now someone comes across it to be like what the hell who's george floyd and what happened here's a little bit of what it is even if it's a wikipedia page I, i'm i'm putting it there yeah because i'm just need some reference to kind of create a little context uh, for someone who might not live in the United States or doesn't know anything about some of the events that are going on. Yeah. Um, Daniel, I'm, I'm so glad you're thinking in the long term, unlike some of us. And this, um, <laughs> actually, um, my boyfriend is an archivist and he's really interested in having like actually people putting information and records um and you know metadata and he said he sometimes he does a does research about like some ancient history and like certain sometimes in a text like in mesopotamia they'll mention some deity but apparently like nobody ever says what it is because they just assume it's everybody yeah. in that society knows but then you know thousands of years later we're like who is this person and, and yeah we don't know <laughs> like so I mean, that, that's the thing even in like you know historical like music analysis where we can go back like just a couple centuries and we're just 
there's become these huge mysteries of like, what did these people mean? Because no one bothered to tell us. Mm-hmm. It was just mm-hmm. everyone was like, oh, they'll they'll, they'll know what tuning system yeah. I meant, or they'll they'll know what this notation was supposed to mean because they did, but now we don't. That uh, stairway to heaven reference is going to be yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, what? what? There was a stairway <laughs> to heaven. So, yeah, I'm sitting even... here like. Uh, oh yeah. no, no, I need to write better show notes. <laughs> You're so you right. Know, when, uh, I was, no. when, when I was a gallery guide at um, the Art Gallery of Ontario, like I eventually. I didn't do this at first, but eventually I started when I'm talking about like Christian art, I'm, I'm, I realized a little while, like we had so many international visitors. I'm like, yeah, not everyone knows who St. Peter's is. So I yeah. started <laughs> saying this St. Peter's is whatever, um, mm-hmm. because like, you don't, you, you can't just assume they know, even though probably they do, but a lot of people actually don't. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just uh, just an, another, sorry, Amelia. I, I mean, I have a million things I'm thinking about. You go first. And then okay, I'll, I was just going to on this show notes thing and not in any way. I also am not trying to like say what you should or should not do, mm-hmm. but just to, to, to say what our show notes practice is, um, is that we it's pretty it's not as detailed as what Dan was saying, but we do try to like I put anything I say that we're going to put, obviously, if we yeah. talk about a text. I'll put a link, you know, we almost always are talking about a medieval or classical text. So there's almost always somewhere online that they can go to find it. So I'll put a link to that or to a translation. Those things are pretty straightforward. Um, and then if I fairly often, if we're talking, I'll have mentioned a, a particular article that I was using or something in the source. So I'll put that stuff in. One of the reasons I do that, and I do think it's important, even if no one goes and looks, because I agree, I don't think most people do, um, is because when I used to teach with podcasts or teach students, I'd say, if you're going to use a podcast as a source, or if you're going to listen to a podcast, how, you know, we had a little class on how do you know if it's a, va- if it's a legitimate podcast or one that's useful or that the material is usable or, you know, what, what are the ways you can distinguish trash from non-trash on the internet? And one of the things is, you know, do they cite their sources? Do they list their references in their show notes? Do they have information? Uh, because otherwise, you know, do, do they, there's other stuff about credentials and you know whatever but like yeah. one of the big things and when in fact then i would ask my students to do their work in class i would be big on them about citing their sources and making sure that they're citing all their sources properly so i'm sort of if i turn around and do a podcast and i'm not <laughs> citing my sources yeah, gotta that model is it. very little hypocrisy and it's not so great mm-hmm. and so and then i don't think like i don't think every podcast needs yeah. yeah, I think it very much depends what you're doing. Like, yeah. you know, Julia, when you guys are doing a podcast where you are yeah. giving your response to a yeah. piece of media, that's a yeah. different kind of citation uh, practice than if I'm yeah. saying, okay, here's, you know, this particular article where somebody talked about how um, the muses were used in Hesiod. Well, I better give the name and the article and a link because otherwise yeah. that's irresponsible. So that's a different kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we do oh, a lot of hedging. Yeah. We, do, we do quite a lot of yeah. hedging on classically trained because the truth is we don't do that much research. Mm-hmm. We are both more or less experts in our own but you're specific sort of off the cuff in the moment. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, like in the moment, we are not like we are just talking about stuff. And we also don't pretend to be producing something scholarly. Like we we don't make any claim to academic rigor on our podcast, really. Yeah. Um it is in some ways an academic exercise, but we don't do a lot of citation because we are not. That's not what you're doing. We, yeah. 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 We're eternally being like, no, uh, we might be totally wrong about this, but this is kind of what we think, you know, like. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's we do. We're... Yeah. We do a lot of the same. Uh, the other thing that I try and do, and this comes up more in my YouTube work than my podcasting work, but I do. If I want to cite something, I'll try and cite it in the work itself instead of because, like I said, I, I know on my YouTube videos, no one's going to read the description. Like I do, I do, I but, promise. Well, fair, that's fair. <laughs> One person is going to read the description, <laughs> um, but like if I say the name of the author and maybe the name of the paper or the book as well in the video, mm-hmm. then that's something people can go Google or whichever search engine they prefer bing i don't know but that way <laughs> you can find it 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 makes it clearer yeah. that i have a source because more people are going to be looking in that space than they're going to be looking in the description yeah there's so many ways of doing this and i think what's great like this whole panel's been fascinating 
about the intertextuality, intermediality, and it, the convergence and overlap. It's all text. It, yeah, in an, <laughs> in an earlier panel, someone used the phrase media ecosystem. And I think that's a nice handy metaphor, but I also want to think about like what other metaphors could be used for all these relationships. I one that came to mind was like a an assembly line, maybe because there's like you all are using other media in yeah. your podcast production, and then those productions get used or listened to and cited and taught and whatever else. And so it's a it's a lot. Um, I wanted to ask. Oh man, I think I had two questions. What were they? I guess just other thoughts on that, that sort of back and forth, but also Ian specifically mentioned like tracking the link traffic. Like, so I want to hear more about that. Like you, you specifically look for, do they click on the show note link to get to what, is that what you meant? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I tend to use is bitly. Okay. For that um because it just gives a, a really clear readout where, but, where where they're coming from yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and what what yeah whether they've actually clicked on the link mm -hmm. um yeah yeah that reminds me of what my other question actually was about the infrastructure like the technology of rss and podcast platforms and apps and how the how the show notes actually even show up versus having them on your website versus having them on Spotify or wherever else podcasts show up. And what, like, what are your thoughts on those types of things and how, like, could, the, could those be improved to help, I don't know, to help you as podcast creators, could they be improved to help listeners? Like, we're running out of time, I know, but these are, these are things to think about. I think one of the drawbacks is you can't put bold type and other stuff in there to make them easier to read. That that's probably the biggest drawback with uh, episode with show notes. Yeah. And I don't think people would, I mean, yeah. the internet is all about reducing friction. That's like the only way to get anybody to look at anything on the internet is to reduce friction as much as possible. So if you want really well-organized show notes, like um, with, whatever html in them and stuff um you have yeah. to kind of put them somewhere else put them on a website or whatever but that requires a listener to click a link and mm -hmm. the fewer links to be clicked to get to look at something the more likely somebody will end up with their eyes on it and it is very hard particularly i mean i am an inveterate media multitasker i am mm -hmm. an inveterate multitasker in general i usually listen to podcasts while i'm doing dishes like my hands are wet i'm not touching my phone um, yeah. or you know like, like that and like with with sincere apologies to all the incredible video essayists i follow i'm frequently not even looking i'll be playing a game on my phone while i listen to a video essay like it's a podcast and stuff like that like mm -hmm. i truly I am the worst. I am the worst. I am like, like the I worst would, person. As if but we know, know, we know I'm a lot of people do that. We're, we're yeah, very used to so, it. So <laughs> your drawings are so amazing, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did just want to say, like Amelia, on your comment about the fact that you do click in the description. I will say the people who actually read the descriptions really appreciate the good descriptions. Yeah. Like every once in a while, on my YouTube videos, I get a comment that's like, "Oh my God, thank you so much for actually citing your sources." Yes. And it is <laughs> even if it's two people, I'm like, "Oh." It's Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and it like it's gotta if you have the time everyone's doing their best of course but if you have the time to do that it is worth it even if it's just the two people the two weirdos that like mm -hmm. yeah. will like after i've done the dishes i will go look at whatever i wanted to look up about your podcast and speaking of clicking links since we are kind of out of time i have uh just posted in the chat the link to the gather space um uh, and we can certainly uh, jump on there um, to continue discussing things. Uh, and oh, of course, uh, Dan has uh, posted there the um, <laughs> the feedback. The if feedback you, you haven't filled out the feedback <laughs> form or the suggestion form, please do so. It's very simple. Um, it helps us, and it's also to grow this community, which is like in the last couple of days has been so vibrant and amazing, and this has been such a great you know, experience to, you know, be in conversation with everyone. So yeah, definitely fill the, fill it out. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong 
link. I, I was going to say. Yeah, uh, that didn't look like a feedback I link. thought I had the right link of. I'm sorry. I've been... Uh, I've been so disorganized today. <laughs> I bet I don't even have it up. Hold on. Well, oh, here it is. Sorry. I'm hoping I can give it. But yeah. Let me it's just the grab one the I link. Just, oh, I just the posted one, it. Yeah, yeah, oh, thank God. Because cool. like, <laughs> yeah. I found, I, did, I copied the wrong thing. Yeah. Thank you. And also, if you just want, if you're interested in being contacted by HPN again in the future and want to sort of know what else we're doing, you can just put your name in it. Even if you don't yeah. Use and I would like to thank everyone for participating in this panel. Uh, we had some great discussion. So thank you, uh, panelists and everyone. Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all.